Hi, this is Dr. Eric Dine with Room Now. I'm coming to you from uh, Summit, New Jersey after um, day three of ACR Convergence. And we have with us Ahmad Sherbini from University of Manchester. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, and it's, I'll look forward to, yeah, to speak to you more about my, my project and my research. Yes, so Dr. Sherbini just gave a great um, oral abstract today uh, as part of the rheumatoid arthritis abstract sessions, looking at methotrexate uh, induced nausea and alopecia and seeing if we can predict which patients are prone to have those side effects. Can you tell us a little bit about your study? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, so methotrexate, although it's been in the market for years now or decades and it's been ex uh, studied extensively, still we have a lot of questions we don't know and like how to certain people respond or how to certain people will most likely develop certain adverse events. And I think uh, we decided to go with nausea and alopecia here because these are uh, important for the patients. And usually um, physicians focusing mainly in other adverse events such, such as uh, liver enzymes and uh, hematologic adverse events. So we wanted to address these kind of adverse events that it is important or, yeah, or matters for the patient, yeah. So we looked at, the, so we, my research is on uh, rheumatoid arthritis medication study, which is a big study of around, with around 2000 uh, patients uh, in, in, in the UK. Uh, we looked at the baseline factors uh, at, at the start of the methotoxate therapy. And uh, we saw if we, these patients uh, are developing uh, alopecia or nausea at six and uh, at 12 months of therapy. Mm -hmm. And, and, and what were some of the, the factors? I think you had a couple um, interesting associations as, as predictors from the baseline as to who may have the side effects. Uh, yeah. So, for example, for nausea, we have like uh, women were more likely to report uh, nausea and alopecia uh, compared to men. Although the majority of patients here are uh, because it's rheumatoid arthritis, usually it's common, more common in, in, in women more than men. So also like we saw an association between alcohol intake or alcohol consumption and, and, the, and both also alopecia and nausea. Uh, it is interesting, but I think this alcohol uh, consumption would need more investigation because we looked at uh, either it, uh, is the patient taking alcohol or not. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be nice to know more in details like uh, how the amount of alcohol or categorizing alcohol intake as mild or moderate. This kind of question maybe need more investigation to confirm this association and, and its effect on different adverse events. Yeah, yeah I think it could be interesting, especially being on a medicine like methotrexate that we know irritates the liver. People who are reporting alcohol use, you have to wonder, you know, how much if, are, are these people that are, are really alcohol um, heavy intake and, and, you know, may have a folate deficiency as a result. Yeah, so it's, it's a good thing that it's, so we know that there's some association between alcohol and liver enzymes. So usually patient, physicians recommend uh, or advise controlling alcohol intake or limiting the alcohol so before starting the treatment. So I think uh, this is maybe emphasizing this point more or, so it's, it's a good advice. Maybe now it's not even, only, it's not only for liver, maybe there's something else here. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a good, so it, I think it's a good point to explore more in the, in the future work and uh, in other studies. And, and um, you know, any plans for the next steps that I, I think it would be really interesting to see, you know, um, folate acid, how that's being prescribed or different uh, doses or administration of, of methotrexate. It sounds like yeah. this real world association for the, for the first study. Yeah, right. in our study, there was limited information around the strategies of uh, folic acids. Uh, so there, there, was, there were a lot of variations, especially in the methoxid dose and the uh, folic acids, because it's coming from different centers around the UK. Uh, so and, uh, until now, we don't have like definitive or guidelines, specific guidelines for these kind of stuff. So we see some patients starting with low dose methoxide or high dose and some with small doses of folic acid or daily uh, folic acid again, uh, versus uh, once weekly folic acids. So I think it's, it's, it's a good idea to look at this uh, at, at maybe different time points instead of only baseline. So right here, maybe this is the first step of, of more projects coming. So uh, we're gonna look maybe more in details of uh, weekly uh, adverse events and uh, other factors that contribute to this adverse events. Yeah, including the methotrexate dose, of course, and the folic acid intake, and uh, the mode of administration—is it uh, subcutaneous or oral methotrexate? Mm -hmm. 
these are all questions. So there's a lot of yeah question we would like to know. Yeah, we always have to balance which factors we want to include or which kind of analysis we want based on our available data or 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 the quality of data we have. And and um, the other interesting finding was that um, it sounds like patients with a with a, a conception going into it that they have concern about side effects in particular. Um, in yeah, so, okay. yeah, so we found yeah. Yeah, that patients who had more concern about uh, nausea in particular here, uh, so we used uh, some certain questionnaires that were, was validated, validated before in rheumatoid arthritis patients. So and we found that patients who were having more concern at the beginning of the therapy developed more adverse events com compared to people who had lower concern. So yeah, this, this is interesting uh, information and... Uh, I, I think we should, yeah, look at this in maybe with different aspects, uh, yeah. But yeah, as I said before, we have limited, yeah, we, we cannot include different factors in, 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 in this model. So we have to limit our choice of, yeah, which one is most relevant here. Yeah, I think it'd be interesting to see, you know, if, if you have any thoughts as to how we should be talking to our patients. We, we want to give them informed consent of the side effects, but maybe not predispose them to be concerned or, or really address the things that can be done. Yes, good question. Yeah, because, yeah, so uh, I, I'm, I'm totally agree with yeah, sharing information and uh, making them a part of the decision to start the, when they start with the new treatment. But it's good, to, uh, at least now with this data, the prevalence of adverse events and uh, the risk of the adverse events, it's good to give them some reassurance maybe now. So, so for example, alopecia is maybe a concern for a lot of patients. So, but the prevalence is not that high, and even, I didn't I didn't include uh, analysis on the severity of alopecia. But not all of them are having a severe alopecia. So maybe sometimes only mild alopecia. So, so some assurance may may help here in in making patients more comfortable and alleviating the concern around this treatment. Mm -hmm. I, excellent, and it, you know everything you presented was was very interesting and, and very practical and. and um, you know, how we can, how we can uh, use it to talk with our patients. So I, I encourage everyone to check out this abstract um, 1444 and, and lots of great information as we had just touched on the surface here. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Sherbini. Thank you for having me and uh, I'll look forward to speak more in, uh, in the future with more research and more projects. Thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. A lot more information on Room Now. I encourage everyone to check it out for the remainder of, of the conference. Yeah, I'm, I'm a follower, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you.